I'm Damien Baxter here from LiveLink and you're joining me today on the Creators Unlocked podcast where we unlock the truth behind what it really takes to monetize as a creator or online expert. Today I'm joined by a best-selling author of the book Business Networking for Dummies but also a keynote speaker and leadership and communications trainer. Stefan Thomas travels around the country and sometimes further afield to entertain, inform, inspire and more importantly teach people practical takeaways they can apply straight away on a practical level. Stefan, thanks so much for being with us here today. You've hopped on a train this morning from a posh part of the country, the Cotswolds, I believe. Yeah, I'm never quite sure whether it's posh. Um, It used to be David Cameron's constituency. (laughs) Um, Jeremy Clarkson lives a few miles up the road. So does that count as posh? I'm not sure whether it does. Are you telling me you're near, what's the name of the diddly squat? Apparently. Have you been? No. <laughs> the Rose no, that's in Chadlington. Uh, no, I've uh, just up the road from us. No, I, I haven't been. Um, I think at least one of my nephews has been and has really enjoyed it there. But that's that's where we live. That's the part of the country uh, that we, we're from. I always, I, well, had I known, I'd have got you to pick me up some bee juice. Oh, really? That's his honey. He's, he's branded it bee juice. I didn't know that. There's other things that he's called other products, but I don't think I can repeat it on the uh, on the podcast here today. But ah, I didn't realise you were from there, though. Beautiful. Locally very controversial because he ignores most planning regulations. Yeah, and he blew up his house or something, which caused a bit of an uh, uproar am- amongst the local community <laughs> as well. So, ah, well, there you go. I've just learned something. I, I didn't realise. That's realize. where we're from. It's absolutely beautiful. Um. How was the weather as well? I know you jumped on the train this morning, didn't you? It's been all right. Um, we started this morning by going to a, a networking event in Oxfordshire. Um, went to a networking event in the village of Milton um, with the wonderful Sarah Sovey. Um, so shout out for Sarah. Um, if she watches this, thank you, Sarah, for this morning. Um, then got the train in from Didcot Parkway. Easiest train journey ever and probably the uh, easiest tube journey across town. Uh, uh, we had to get off. I think there's some flooding on some mm, of the, the stations. Today, yeah. So we had to change where we didn't expect to change. Mm. Um, and I'm a country boy. That sort of thing scares me. I had my route planned out and when we had to vary it, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it has. Been. <clears throat> I woke up this morning and thought, gosh, it's it's really chucking it down. And um, random story for you. Throughout the winter, we've had quite a lot of wasps. So I'm actually in the, the countryside of Cambridgeshire. That's where I live. And they've been, someone's going to correct me here, but they've been chewing through my roof. So I've got holes in my tiles on my on my, on my wow. actual roof. Um, and now it's chucking it down. I'm getting very, very nervous about... Um, our house. (laughs) So I'm trying to find tiles from the 1950s that that now fit my house. So there you go. Anyway, that's a random story. We digress. We've talked about bee juice. We've talked about wasps. I know. Are there any other stinging flying insects we ought to to bring up this afternoon? Three minutes in as well. So I'm sure we've got lots more to talk about. (laughs) Well, I am going to jump straight in. Bit of a tongue twister for me here. But you've gone from shoe shop assistant to prestigious trainer and author. How does that happen? Well, 40 years is is one of the ways that it happened. I was a shoe shop assistant in 1983, um, so 39 years, I, I guess that is. So I was 13 years old in the days when you could get a Saturday job in a shop when you were 13 years old. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to go on holiday. My mum and dad said I could go on holiday. And I had to pay for it myself. I'd been invited by some friends. Good on Um, So I had to go out and find a Saturday (laughs) job. True story. And it's, yeah, it stood me in really good stead. So the way that that happens is going from shoe shop assistant to habitat store assistant. Um, Then in 1988, becoming an estate agent. Did that for almost 20 years. Um, Left the estate agency in 2007. Started a little franchise business, joined a networking organisation, and then in in 2012, someone asked me if I'd write a book. Um, so that's the sort of journey, really. That's how it's gone. Do you have cobbler on your CV? No, oh. I probably should. I sold <laughs> shoes rather than making them. Oh, okay. or, or, or more to the point, I sold Scotchgard. People came in to buy shoes. Okay. But my job was to flog them Scotchgard. Um, this show is not sponsored by Scotchgard, but that was <laughs> that was my job in the shoe shop. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So quite a journey then. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Okay. Well, on the topic of that, 
Next question. You've spoken at over 600 physical events yeah. and significantly more online as well, I'm sure. You're in high demand, <laughs> first of all, by the sounds of it. Cast your mind back to those early days then. How did you go from working as a, a shoe shop assistant to the next job, to the next job, to the next job, to suddenly having that light bulb moment where you said, I've got an idea here, and then go on to monetize through your own personal brand? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love... I'd love to tell your listeners that there was always some master plan, but there just wasn't. Most of this happened by accident. Um, when I worked in a shoe shop, it was a Saturday job. Mm -hmm. So a few <clears throat> years later, when I got offered a better paid job at, at Habitat, I went and took that. Um, the rest of the stuff has happened broadly by, by accident. I um, have always been able to engage with people and learned more about that in the shoe shop. So the estate agency career happened because I was pretty good at engaging with people. Um, the estate agency career came to a really disastrous end. Um, so I ended up doing something else and getting stuck into networking. And then just got good at talking to people about networking and going to networking events. There's going to come a point when someone says, you know, the 10 minute speaker slot we do every week, why don't you do it next week? And that happened. And that happened. And that was... The first time I spoke in front of an audience talking about my own stuff, I'd presented for employers before that um, at conferences and, and that sort of thing. But the first time someone said at a networking event, oh, will you stand up and talk? Mm. And I was reading from a sheet of paper and I was really very nervous. Um, and then fast forward a few years when someone said to me, oh, you, you speak at all of these networking events. How much would you charge to come and speak at our conference. That was, so it's, there was no master plan to be a speaker. There was no master plan to be an author. Someone asked me to write the book, um, which is all, all very lovely. It tells us a little bit about content as well, because I was always putting out enough content that someone asked me to write the book and putting out enough content in terms of spoken content that someone asked me if I charged to speak. But actually along the way, it all fell into place. So that was business networking for dummies. Yeah. Yeah. I was speaking at an event at Excel, um, and Wiley, the publishers of the Dummy series of books, saw me speak. And later on that evening, they asked me if I'd be interested in writing a book for them. Oh, That's, wow. I, I didn't ever really consider writing a book until they came to me and said, how do you fancy writing a book for us? That's mm -hmm. how that happened. Gosh, so it's all just sort of fallen into place. Yeah, I, I, I get this. Someone posted <coughs> on my Facebook timeline ages ago. <coughs> you were just in the right place at the right time regarding me being asked to write the book. Being in the right place at the right time is really easy if you work as hard as I've done over the years in being in lots of places. You've said that I've spoken over 600 times in places, probably more than that now. But the guy who said you were in the right place at the right time, he had chosen not to go to that show at XL that I'd chosen to go to. And I spent two days there. And I did that for seven years on the trot before... Wiley came there and saw me speak. I think you're being a bit humble, actually, to say that you're in the right place at the right time. Someone else said it about me, yeah. It, well, it's, it's on one uh, side of things, you were in the right place at the right time. But on the other side, the content or the um, creation or the creative that you brought to that place at that time also contributed towards where you've got to now. So... Um, I think you should be very proud of what you've achieved, basically, is what I'm saying. I think you've done incredibly well. And um, obviously, the sort of content that you're putting online and also that you're giving to people physically um, is obviously doing exceptionally well and resonates with a lot of people. So, I, I guess I was creating content before creating content was thought of as a thing. Yeah. Um, I was posting on business forums on the internet. Yeah. I was speaking at networking events without considering that that was content. But yeah, you're right. There was something about my, some of the messages that I speak about on stage now are the same messages that I was talking about at networking events 12 and 15 years ago. I never thought of it as content, <clears throat> but actually speaking in front of a live audience is as much content as writing something for LinkedIn or mm. creating a video for, for <clears throat> YouTube. Um, I just never thought of it like that. Mm. A, a lot of people watching this right now will be, I say watching, a lot of people will be listening to this right now. And I'm sat here with my iPad looking at questions that I've prepared to ask you. Um, you are a public speaker. Um, 
do you also have notes or have you managed to get to a stage now where you are quite comfortable speaking off the bat so to speak yeah when i when i speak on stage there aren't any visible notes there okay. um there are occasions if i'm doing if i'm talking about business networking which is the my my the biggest subject that i talk about mm. i can do that with without any visible notes I do rehearse beforehand. Like Good. everyone else who ad libs all the time, a lot of what I ad lib is actually quite rehearsed. Okay. I think people know that, <laughs> um, but they certainly know that now. Sometimes on a big stage, there's like a lip around the front of the stage uh -huh. where you can hide your notes and um, musicians will hide their set lists and, and that sort of thing. I did not know that. If I'm doing, um, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I ran um, a day and a half of leadership training mm. um, for, in a very specific industry, in the in the chemical industry, then I will have notes because I'm talking about stuff that I'm not necessarily completely fluent at, mm. um, so need to, to have notes to refer to. But when I speak and when, when I do things like this, um, yeah, I'm just well, rolling with it. I can tell everyone that's listening now, this is not rehearsed. You no, are very much isn't. talking no. to me now as a, you know, it's just a general conversation. So a lot of the... Uh, teachings that you did um, were very much in in the physical presence, very much yeah. face to face. COVID hits twenty twenty. That must have been really hard for you. Yeah, it, it was in twenty nineteen. Most of my income came from public speaking, mm. and in twenty twenty it didn't. <clears throat> Um, and on March the 16th, 2020, I, I, I remember the March the 13th, 2020, I'm just working out the dates, March the 16th, I remember exactly where we were. Um, March the 16th, the world started to, to go a bit wrong. Um, yeah. Sharon and I were due to be flying to Lanzarote. We got to the bottom of the stairs on the plane and they told us about this, this thing called COVID that we were just learning about and they were no longer flying to, to places like Lanzarote. As you were at the bottom of the stairs for the We'd plane? We'd gone through security. We were out on the runway. We were stood out on the tarmac. And they so made the that bottom decision. of the stairs. The pilot came to the top of the stairs and announced that we were all going back inside. No. And simultaneously to that, driving home, um, we took advantage of easy jets hotel for the night and their dinner for the night. Then we were driving home the next day and I started getting emails. Hey, Steph, you know that conference you booked for? Well, oh, no. it ain't happening this year. Mm -hmm. um, and that day... As as we drove back, yeah, we could have given it up, but what else? What else do I do? Um, I, I talk to people; it's what I do. And I started speaking to some of the people that we'd worked for before, um, or that I'd worked before, and giving them a different idea of to <clears throat> if you had a sales team, how they were now going to need to engage on Zoom and Teams and Google Meet rather than in real life and started putting myself out there that I would train people how to do that. At the same time, training myself how to speak virtually. So was that the first time that you officially became a full-time, I know we had a conversation upstairs before, but a full-time content creator, full-time online expert, full-time online influencer, however you want to phrase it. Was that when you first made that transition? I'm not sure. I, I, I started putting content out without knowing that it was content on business forums mm -hmm. around 2007. Okay. I got into Twitter in 2008. Um, so I was already putting content out there and realizing that the benefit of content to me was that I could fulfill what I wanted to do, which was give loads of value to, to other people. In giving value to other people, they were spotting me and were approaching me to, to speak and that sort of thing. So I, 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 I spun around and... Certainly during lockdown, I put out more content and we batched more content and we thought of, we all thought of different ways to create content dur yeah. during that period as well. So whether I ever completely transitioned to that, I, I don't know, but certainly <coughs> putting content out there became incredibly valuable. And at the same time, LinkedIn evolved quite a lot as well, as we all know. And LinkedIn as a platform evolved to be somewhere where it became really comfortable for me to put a load of content. That's interesting. That sort of leads me on to my next question, actually. So here we are post-COVID, hopefully. Yeah. Um, we are in what is our new new norm, our new normal world. What does monetization now look like for you? What is your main channel of monetization now? Now, that really does go back to March the 16th, 2020, when we really had to start thinking of things differently. Yeah. Um, speaking for a living is is basically the gig economy on on a different scale 
but you're still reliant on people booking you. You're still reliant on selling yourself all the time. So I never did like the word pivot, but it's what I did. Yeah. Um, so during 2020, we, I started doing consultancies with people, doing the training, doing the virtual training that we've talked about. Um, I launched a, a, a club for business owners um, where I mentor them and, and um, facilitate their networking as well. And I charge for that. Online. On, online. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've just literally just run a session for those folks before we came downstairs to, to do this yeah. because we do all of that virtually. Um, and I charge for that. People pay a, a, a monthly amount to, to be a member of that to work with me. Um, I'll end that that advert break right there. Um, but, <laughs> but then the speaking came back as well. So what monetization looks for me looks like for me now is that I put a ton of content out there. I very much follow um, Gary Vaynerchuk's advice on this. Mm. All the content I put out there is for free. If people want me to speak at their event, well, I charge for that. If people want to be a member of my club, well, we charge for, for, for that as well. Or if people want consultancy, then that's charged for. So the monetization of my content comes not from the content itself, but from the opportunities which the content creates. So when you say you put out content, where, where do you put it? I write a lot for LinkedIn mm -hmm. um, and put a lot of content out there on LinkedIn. I create quite a lot of videos. Um, if I speak at an event like a business show, mm -hmm. we we will video my keynote at that event and then we'll put that out as a 25 minute YouTube. We'll also put reels out there on, on Instagram and Facebook particularly. Um, so I I put a load of written content out there. That's my my go to uh, content is is written. Um, but we also do a fair amount of, of video as well and, and put that out on YouTube and Instagram. Primarily. So is it fair to say you're most active on LinkedIn and yes. on the social platforms? Yes. <clears throat> okay, cool. So with that in mind then, how much money do you actually make directly or indirectly through LinkedIn? Yeah, I wish I could answer that question. I wish I was that scientific <laughs> because um, I, I got a speaking inquiry yesterday, which absolutely 100% has come from a piece of content I put out on LinkedIn 10 days ago. I absolutely know where that inquiry has come from. So... That speaking inquiry, if it comes off, mm -hmm. will be very valuable to us. The the income will be thousands of, of pounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, but I, what I don't do is track where every single penny comes from. Because um, I put content out there in so many places. Yeah. What I know is that a load of the inquiries that I get come from LinkedIn. Or I've got another inquiry come from someone who I've worked with for before. But the reason he's got in touch now is because I've been gently keeping in touch with him on LinkedIn. That's interesting, actually. So is this because you're building almost a community on LinkedIn? Yeah. 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 It's, it's almost like LinkedIn is, is where my community is. You've got all of the connections that I've got on LinkedIn. Then you've got those couple of hundred people that engage with me mm. regularly. They're the sort of um, closer people. And then you've got the 50 or so people in, in my club who are the sort of um, inner uh, circle, I guess. I don't even like that expression, but people know what I mean. So, yeah, the, the, the people who follow me on LinkedIn, the people who I follow, that's become my community. It, it's really interesting as to how local has changed for me. Mm. You've talked about the fact that we live in a small village in, in West Oxfordshire, not far yeah. away from Jeremy Clarkson. Yeah. So in the, village, in, the, in, the, in the town, the small town, sorry, that we live in, that's local for me, but I also consider my LinkedIn community local as well because yeah. I'm just as in touch with them, even in their, if they're in Melbourne or close yeah. to me, <clears throat> as I am with the people who I geographically live close to. Hey, it's now at LiveLink here. We're making it possible for creators and experts to teach anything online. It is the easiest way to monetize your audience. We'll even sort out your video editing and email marketing for you, leaving you to do what you do best creating liveing.vip where creators and experts teach it's funny actually because you've probably got more people on your linkedin community than in your physical community back home yeah. i don't know how big your community is yeah. but uh, it sounds like it's quite a small place yeah so certainly I, the people i'm connected with in our local community that would definitely be the case yeah absolutely so in a way i suppose that linkedin although how do we rephrase this you are not monetizing from linkedin directly no 
But actually what you are doing is you're using LinkedIn as a platform for your community, yeah. which you are then directly monetizing from. Yeah, absolutely so. And yeah. we've got a couple of other things coming up. I've got a live event coming up. I'm going to rerun a, um, a series of online workshops that I did a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. My main sales and marketing platform for them will be LinkedIn. Mm. So I'll be heavily promoting the stuff that I'm doing through LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds so I don't know if that answers the question, how much money do I make from it? But for me, that's, that's yeah, is it is it everything that I make comes from the content I put out there or is it some of it? Or is everything I make somehow connected to the content I put out there? I think that's more likely to, mm. to be the answer to that. So you run, you've obviously got your book, yeah. which is Business Networking for Dummies. Yeah. I've said that a few times. Nice little Thank sale, you. Sale I'm very, you. very glad say of that. one more time, Business Networking <laughs> for Dummies. Yeah. In uh, Where do you sell it? Go on, you may as well finish the ad So, out. So Business Networking yeah. for Dummies is published by Wiley. Yeah. Um, so that's sold everywhere on Amazon, everywhere in the world on, on Amazon okay. and other platforms as well. Um, after that, Wiley invited me to write the second book, um, instant networking that's also sold all over the world on Amazon um, and the third book which was self-published um, which I co-wrote with the wonderful Wes Linden um, is called Win the Room same again that's on Amazon and plus we we sell them at the events I speak at as well I should have requested a signed copy I didn't even think I've missed we, an opportunity we kicked ourselves Sharon and I on the train this morning that we forgot to bring books with oh. us that's the absolute truth I'm going to send you a stamp address post I will get one back to you no I'll promise I'll get one to you Oh, no, that's very definitely. kind. I would like to read it, actually. I'll it definitely very send one to you, yeah. So. Um, all right, I'm going to jump. Sorry, no, I'm not. I've got one more question on that. So you've got your book, you've got workshops, and then you've also got an element of entertainment, did I read? Um, I, well, when I, sp- when I speak, um, I've just written a post on LinkedIn today, actually. You know, one of the things that I do is entertain the, the audience. I make sure that yeah. quite often at conferences... I'll be put on either straight after lunch, the the, the graveyard slot, or <laughs> is that what it's known as? Or, or straight after the finance director, or straight after a very uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was wrapped around um, a presentation on inorganic chemicals. Yeah, L- literally, that's what they went <laughs> off to do. Right. So part of my job is to entertain the audience because they want to go home feeling uplifted. They want to go home feeling a bit lighter. Um, so. I believe, and the feedback that I've had is that I'm entertaining on stage. I'm not an entertainer as such. Two of my sons are musicians. Um, yeah. So there's no comedy. Oh, apparently I'm quite funny. I think quite, quite a lot. Funny. <laughs> if, if you've seen my keynotes, quite a lot of what I say, I, I believe is quite funny. Okay, so and Sharon pretends to laugh at my jokes sometimes <laughs> as well. Sorry for, for for your listeners. Sharon's my wife, who's sat in the studio with us at the moment as She's well. She's doing social media for us today, isn't <laughs> yeah. she? So yeah, we've hired her on social media. All right, you so, should. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so I want to talk about Mr. Beast. Yeah. So Mr. Beast has posted 11 times in 2022. So we're in November. So I guess that's a post a month, let's say. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is he could potentially be a very seasonal content creator. Yeah. My question to you is, many content creators are getting burnt out. Have you experienced burnt out, uh, burnout? And yeah. how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, definitely I, I have um, written about it on LinkedIn in 2018, I experienced burnout in in quite a spectacular way. Um, one of the ways that I deal with it in terms of content, specifically in terms of content, is that I don't take the advice that you have to turn up every single day, whether or not you've got something to say. Um, I turn up with content when I believe I've got something valuable to say to the audience. And do you know what? There are some days when I can't be asked. Mm. There are some days when, you know, Sharon and I have got five kids between us. We've got a family. I did not know that. So, yeah, there's five kids between us. We've got families. We've got other stuff that goes on around us. Yeah. Sometimes I'm not in the mood to create content, and I don't force myself to churn it out if I'm just not feeling it. I'm going to make a very nerdy marketing comment here now. So a lot of the people that I speak to working in marketing every day will say, oh, you can't possibly miss a day of posting yeah. or certainly not a working day because you'll be punished by social media algorithms. Yeah. You need to be out there continuously. Do you care? No, not at all. Because if, if I cared too much about stuff like that, I'd get stressed about it. Mm. And I, I pay zero attention to algorithms. I'm not that type of content creator. Good. I'm primarily a, a, a speaker. Mm-hmm. So 
the purpose of my content is to educate the audience because it turns out I know stuff about networking that helps other people. Mm. And the other purpose of my content is that it attracts inquiries for, for the other stuff that I do. So I certainly don't don't force myself to, to do it and don't pay too much attention to algorithms because I, I spot so many people getting stressed about algorithms, but they hardly ever post. Mm. I... I engage with other people at least as much as I post my engage with other people far more than I post myself. Yeah. And for me, that's the the algorithm that works the best. That I'm there to genuinely engage with other people and not put myself at the mercy of Microsoft or Meta or whoever it happens to be who choose who sees my posts. It's funny, and it's through my own doing. I've only got myself to blame, but my feed on LinkedIn in particular is flooded with, you know, tips and advice for when to post how to post yeah. and you know latest in digital marketing you know you've got to post every day and then you don't comment till the following day so it reboosts the post and then you've got to trick the algorithms and you're absolutely right you need to as long as you're putting out good content that resonates with your audience i think that the rest will just come come naturally yeah and it's always been that's always been the spirit in which I post content. If I feel that I've got something to say which will be valuable to other people, I'll post it. Mm. And I don't pay attention to what time of day I should post <laughs> it, which is really rubbish of me to to be talking about on a... On You've a, got fans in Melbourne. You should pay attention. Right? Yeah, I, 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 I can't pay attention to... to um, I've got, for one reason or another, I've got a reasonable community in Sydney and Melbourne um, because of some connections that I've got there. Oh, so, really? Is that yeah, what it is? Networking connections over there, so yeah. Maybe you'll be on uh, stage with Kylie at the Sydney Opera House in there before, <laughs> one day soon. Who knows? <laughs> For the fireworks on New we Year's. Going like to that, Sydney. That's yeah, that would be good it, fun. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's imagine I'm a public speaker. No, yeah. I'm not a public speaker, but I want to become a public speaker. Okay. So I'm going to ask you right now for your advice. What's the best platform for me to create content today? LinkedIn versus TikTok. What's your answer? This might be. I'm going to sound rubbish, but I'm 52 years old, so that's going to bias my answer quite a bit. I feel much more native on LinkedIn than I do on TikTok, and I'm rubbish at posting TikToks. My belief is that the people who will book me to speak are more likely to be on LinkedIn than they are on TikTok. So my advice would be to put your energy into LinkedIn. There is a secondary piece of advice, which is this that sometimes the people who actually pay me to speak aren't the people who do the research in the first place. Okay. The people who do the research may be younger than the people who actually eventually hire the speakers. So that's why I'm active on Instagram. I'm still not active enough on TikTok in my opinion, because if someone asks someone else in the office, do you know any public speakers, that person may be more native on Instagram or TikTok than they are on LinkedIn. Mm. But the person who pays the bills may be more active on LinkedIn. That so I'm putting my I'm putting my effort into LinkedIn at the moment. <clears throat> I keep feeling like I should be spending more and I pay attention to Gary Vaynerchuk as well. He keeps telling us that we should be spending more time on link on TikTok as well. Well, I guess it just depends on where your target market are hanging out. If you're if all your friends and the people that like you say pay the bills are on LinkedIn. Why wouldn't you be active on LinkedIn? But then you've got, you know, young entrepreneurs coming up. Future people. Future, yeah, and, and people who are um, more native on, on TikTok, who've spent more time on TikTok. Mm. Or someone asks around in the office, do you know any public speakers? And the person who's been watching someone's TikToks is the one who answers the question. Mm. That's why I try and spread myself across as many platforms as possible but I don't spend anywhere near enough time on, on TikTok at the moment. Do you know, I have a Gen Zer at, in okay. my office. I say a Gen Zer. I'm very much in the millennial category. He's very much in the Gen Z category. So he's grown up with TikTok. Yep. And like you, I've grown up with Facebook, MySpace and LinkedIn and going way, way back at another platform called Face Party, it was called. Um, and we have debates all the time about LinkedIn versus TikTok. And he says, and I quote, LinkedIn's dead make way for TikTok. Okay. As, as, as bluntly as that. You know. I, I think the thing that we, we do know is that in 2007, I was on business forums on the internet mm. where you had to press the refresh button or mm. press F5 to see if anyone else had posted since you last posted. Yeah. 
then Twitter happened and I watched the, the famous Gary Vaynerchuk YouTube that got a load of us over onto to Twitter. Um, then after Twitter, Facebook started making a bit of a name when Facebook pages came out. Um, then Instagram came along and then LinkedIn yeah. really reinvigorated itself from what it had been. We're, we all, you know, the person that's been talking to you may well be right. We do know, all of us know and should know, that my career has gone from the internet not existing, the internet existing, web 2.0 existing, and now whatever comes next. So the next platform, we don't even know about it yet. No, no, it's it's too true. So, you know, I always tell the people I work with, just stay on top of the trends, you know, keep your eyes out and and, and move with the times. And, yeah. and if your target market go from LinkedIn to somewhere else, then follow them if you have to. So, or try and be there before them. Or try even, and be, better. even better advice, yeah. <laughs> On that topic, actually, Elon Musk takes over Twitter and charges eight dollars per month for a blue tick. Yeah, it's all over the news at the moment. Yeah, what does that mean for creators? It means it's another distraction. It for me, it's like paying far too much attention to the algorithm. Um, I, I will say up front, I don't have a blue tick. I've never tried to get a blue tick. Um, maybe I should. Um, and I'd pay $8 a month for one, but I think it's a distraction worrying about it. If, if the content that you put out there is valuable enough, people will be paying attention to it. And, and stay in your own lane. What Elon Musk does with Twitter, it, it's out of our control. It's utterly out of our control. So stay in control of the content that you put out there. Put out decent content. Find the platforms that work for you. It may affect his business on, on Twitter. I don't know. Um, it may negatively affect the quality of the content that's put on Twitter because people will be paying to be recognized on there rather than being recognized on their merits as they have been before. Um, but if you're a content creator, then... Yeah, distractions like that are going to happen. We've talked about it. COVID happened. Mm. In my career, the internet happened. Social media happened. Something little, like Elon Musk charging for something which Twitter didn't charge for last week, it's something really tiny to be distracted by. He holds so much waiting, though, does Elon Musk. Yeah. He can say something on Twitter, and the next day it totally affects the stock market, or it totally affects you know the way in which the creator economy has to move forwards on Twitter. You yeah. know, he has so much waiting. He, he does. And we're all talking about Twitter. You and I are sat here talking about Twitter, whereas if Elon Musk hadn't done that, no. Twitter would probably not have formed part of this conversation. So I think he's really clever. He um, it's like Ryanair. You know, Ryanair said they were going to charge to use the toilet. <laughs> we were all charged. They've never introduced it. We all talked about, we're still talking about Ryanair. So I think Elon Musk has been really clever with that because now we're all talking about Twitter. Whereas beforehand, we would have just spent this conversation talking about TikTok and LinkedIn. I'm going off topic here, but does that tie in with no publicity is bad, bad publicity? Yeah, I, I, I don't completely agree with the <laughs> sentence, but no. I do agree with the sentiment. Mm. Um, yeah, Elon Musk is very clever about this. Well, he's, you know, he's, he's got to be clever to have got to where he is, mm. um, but he's got us talking about Twitter. So it is still publicity so he's done his job exactly how he wanted to right absolutely so on a podcast for content creators <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah no absolutely I mean it's like I say it holds a lot of waiting yeah. so um, alright we're going to tie up and finish up pretty soon I've got a couple more questions Go to on. ask you Stefan um, what does the future look like for Stefan Thomas so obviously we spoke a lot about moving trends and the way in which we are moving towards other platforms etc 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 do you feel like, and I know you love this word, do you feel like you are going to need to pivot away from your current, not necessarily your current strategy, but your current setup to another direction? Yeah, not necessarily another direction, but just thinking about future-proofing myself. Mm. I've mentioned already I'm 52 mm. and most of what I get paid for right now involves me turning up. Yeah. Um. So looking at streaming platforms platforms where some of my premium content, some of my paid for content could be evergreen rather than me having to constantly provide it live. That makes much more sense for me. Um, what, what do you mean by evergreen? So for example, 
recording content mm -hmm. that then people can, recording premium content that then people can have some sort of hybrid model where I've got like a, a recorded seminar. Mm. So I don't have to be there to put it out there. Yeah. But as part of someone's subscri subscription, um, they get uh, some access to me as well. Okay. So I think that's what the future looks like for me, that I'm not constantly having to... Um, do the networking retreat as as a live event, for example, but some of that content can be more easily accessible by the people who want to digest it online, wherever they are in the world, whatever time um, zone they're in in the world, but they get some access to me as well. Speaking, will, speaking live will continue to form a big part of what I do, but putting more content on virtual platforms Will, will make a load more sense for me. Have you started thinking about that already? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Mm. And, and, and frankly, since our conversation a few weeks ago, I've started yeah. thinking about it more and more. So yeah. we need, <laughs> advert for LiveLink, we need to take that conversation forward as well. And we will do, absolutely. Yes. You're, you are perfectly <laughs> we, we, fitting we into really our target market. We really need to have market. it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. You are our target market, Stefan, so that's fantastic. Um, amongst others, of course. So um, last question from me then, and then I'll let you uh, get on because I know you've got a date with a restaurant this evening, have you? Yeah, we have. It was um, Oaxaca where I was asked to write Business Networking for Dummies. That That's was where right. they first took me for lunch. Um, so whenever I'm in London, I always have a little pil pilgrimage there because it was that meeting that really did change my life. So we're heading to Oaxaca later on. I might give you a call tomorrow and see what the new big idea is after your uh, your meal this evening. Oh, that's a good so. idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my little epiphany. All right, last question, I promise. So has creating content helped you become a better public speaker and how, if so? Yeah, really specifically because I can test my content. Before I put anything on stage, I've recorded it as content. I've put it out there mm. and you can see the reactions you get from people plus... The questions you get from people when you put content out there leads me to think about other things that I should talk about from stage. Because the questions that I get, that's what's on the minds of people who are thinking about leadership, thinking about networking. That gives me the answer to, that gives me the option to answer those questions directly on stage. So mm -hmm. creating content, yeah, keeps my um, stage keynotes and presentations really alive because I'm listening to what people reply to me yeah so you essentially take the best bits yeah and pretty much so your, your public yeah, speaking absolutely <laughs> yeah it was it, we went to a comedy show last week actually i mean it was just a local comedy show and they did the exact same thing they brought all of their jokes they looked at which one got the biggest laugh and then that's not the one that they took to live at the apollo and that's how um, trailers for movies work as well isn't yeah. it you get to see the best bits most of the time so yeah yeah, yeah. so you can tell the whole story yeah well, Stefan, I won't take up too much more of your time. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We are genuinely, or well, we were very genuinely excited to have you join us. And hopefully we can maintain this relationship moving forwards and um, look at all the exciting new pivots and things that you do in the future. I've really enjoyed this, like genuinely. It's Good. been an absolutely fantastic conversation. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for having me along. No, it's my pleasure. And we'll hope to speak to you again soon. Sure we will.